So you can see what we're going to cover. We'll, we'll, we'll really just confirm the system components. We're not going to get into a whole lot of detail about architecture. We will touch on sizing. Uh, we'll talk about the logs. We'll talk about service accounts, workflows, and connectors. We'll touch on the data warehouse and the portal. And we'll touch on application configuration. We've got about 25 minutes or so to cover all of this, so we're not going to cover any of it in a lot of detail. It'll be broad brush, but I think it'll probably give you a pretty good idea of the kinds of things that you're going to want to take a look at if you're looking to confirm the health of an existing service manager environment. So, again, we're looking at an environment that already exists, and this is really just to kind of confirm the components. So, Nick, why don't you step through the components that we expect to find in a service manager environment. Sure. So I'm just going to walk my way through this diagram with you guys and explain what each of the components are and what their general function uh, is. So I'm going to start here in the middle with the service manager management server. This is the application server um, that's going to run the service manager application. And it's uh, going to run some workflows and other things, but primarily it's going to establish the connection between the client console and the service manager database. So I'll move through to the Service Manager Database uh, server here. This would be uh, hosting the Service Manager Operational Database. This would be where the CMDB uh, resides. And all of our operational data is there. All of our configuration items and all of our work items for their data retention period uh, are going to reside there. We also have the Data Warehouse Management Server, which is responsible for running all of the data warehouse jobs. And what it is going to do is it's going to take data from the service manager database and it's going to move it through a series of uh, databases in the data warehouse until it eventually ends in the DW data mart which stores the data for long-term reporting and then you can access that data through reports in SSRS or uh, analysis services. Moving up then we've got two components for the self-service portal. There's a web content server um, and that's responsible for getting data from the service manager database and then presenting it on the self-service portal, which is a SharePoint 2010 based uh, portal, which clients would access through Internet Explorer or uh, the browser of their choice. The last component here then is the um, console itself. The service manager console is a rich client uh, that would either be installed on each user's local machine or would be accessible through terminal services or um, some sort of um, remote services application like that. All right, so those are the components. Now, sizing is is really one of the chief ways that you can control uh, and improve performance. Um, so what we're looking at now are the typical inputs to system sizing. Yeah, what we have here, and, and, and these are uh, general figures, and, and generally what we like to do when we come into an environment that's already been established is make sure that these things are going to marry up with the, the sizing that's already been established. So really we're interested in knowing the number of supported uh, end users. Um, and uh, as an extension of that, how many work items per month are we doing for those end users? And that's going to help give us an idea of the volume of tickets that are going to be moving through the system. Um, that's important both for knowing how large the databases are going to get as well as understanding how many sort of transactions we're going to have in a period of time so we know um, what sort of memory and processor resources are going to uh, need to exist on the management servers. We also want to know how many configuration items are going to be managed inside of Service Manager. Um, and, and this is beyond just a straight count of the CIs that you sort of logically have. We really need to know how many CI records are going to exist. Um, and there are typically a lot more records in the system than you, than you have actual CIs in your environment. Um, for instance, you know, all of your service accounts, all of machine accounts, um, really everything in Active Directory and potentially everything in Operations Manager and Configuration Manager. So we like to get general accounts for there so we can help uh, make sure that the databases are sized appropriately. And last, uh, here is the number of concurrent application consoles that are going to be connected. So if it's a service desk organization that's got 100 people inside of it, we'd like to know that maybe half of them are going to be connected all of the time and the other half are going to be connected only when they need to be. And that's really going to help us understand um, how much memory is going to be required and how much processor is going to be required on the management service to handle those connections. What we have here are some um, 
general guidelines in terms of the uh, sort of buckets that, that we see our clients falling into, sort of small, medium, and large environments. These vary greatly, obviously. We, you know, we've had uh, some organizations with uh, a much higher ratio of analysts to end users and some that are much lower than these. But these are sort of the general buckets that we see folks falling into. And Microsoft has made available some documentation that will help you fit uh, these capacity estimates with uh, your sizing infrastructure. And we'll make sure that the link to that is included in the YouTube video that, that accompanies this after it gets published. Okay, so the, the logs. We've got a couple of kinds of logs here that we can consult. We've got the install log. I'll give you a screenshot of that. And Nick, why don't you confirm the location for this? Yeah, the, the install log, um, you know, the, the usefulness for this is, is mostly around failed installs. This is really where you're going to get most of your information about why an installation has failed. But if we're coming into an environment that's already, uh, where service managers already been deployed, we like to review these anyway, just to make sure there isn't any anomalies in them. Those will be located in the app data uh, local temp folder under the user directory for the user that did the actual installation. So they don't get published to a shared location. Sometimes they can be a bit tricky to find, especially if it is an older environment that was installed maybe a number of months ago. But you can see there the file location for these are under the app data local temp directory for the user that did the install. And then we've got, uh, of course, the uh, uh, event log, uh, which is actually not under service manager, it's under operations manager. Yeah, and the um, we're not going to go through any specific event IDs to look out for here. Um, that's the sort of thing that will vary greatly from system to system. Um, but generally, when we're doing a health check, this is going to be one of the primary places that we go to understand the health of the system. Um, we'll go through as far back as the events allow us to go through, as far back as they go. Um, and we'll gather up all of the uh, especially the errors and warnings, but also the information events and, and parse through them and, and try to identify some issues. There are um, some warnings and errors that will happen as a matter of course and that you can ignore, uh, like with most applications, uh, and then there are ones that are indicative of a problem, so that's a pretty good place to check. And I think the one thing we'd say is that you, you may want to increase the, uh, uh, the event log size from the default 16 megs, because uh, particularly if you install the exchange connector and you have it set to, to log at the highest level, um, you're probably not going to get more than what, a day or so of, of events. Yeah, generally less than a day. So we always would recommend increasing the size of this log or have it archived automatically so you can keep a running, you know, uh, maybe a week's worth of events so that you've got enough information to go back and do some digging. Because sometimes you don't know you have a problem, um, you don't realize the symptoms of that problem. Uh, until long after the, the source of that problem has occurred. So. so service accounts, I know we, we seem to go through um, a lot of discussion up front when we work with customers where we're installing a new environment about their service accounts. Um, we need a service account, we need a workflow account, but we could potentially have a lot of service accounts overall for the application. So. Um, I wanted to talk about what we typically see and some of the best practices around service accounts. Sure. Yeah, I mean, when we're coming into an existing environment, the first thing we like to understand is, is what the, the layout for those service accounts are. You can share Active Directory user accounts between multiple Run-As accounts and Service Manager, and some folks decide to have a different AD user for each Run-As account and Service Manager. Um, the most common thing we see is to have one... Uh, AD account for the service account, which would also be the account for all of the connectors, and then a second AD account for the workflow account. Um, that tends to be what we see as the most common, uh, and those accounts are shared between service manager and the data warehouse often. Uh, and, and that works. I, we like that approach, I think. Um, it's simple. It's easy to manage. The permission sets are, are fairly straightforward to manage. Um, so we like that, um, but, but we've seen uh, a lot of different, we've seen some folks go the most simplistic route where they've got one AD account that's for everything. Um, for some folks that might be a security concern, um, but it, it's certainly the most simple option. And then we've seen the other extreme where every 
uh, run as account has a different AD account associated with it, which is probably more secure, is a little bit more difficult to manage. Um, and, and I think the other thing that we recommend is don't share service accounts between different environments. So for example, if you have a dev environment and a production environment, use separate sets of service accounts. Yeah, absolutely. That's especially true with the workflow account where we've got conflicts potentially with the exchange connector and, and other connectors and things like that. So th that's uh, a pretty strong recommendation that we like to make. So when we're going uh, and looking at the environments then, we, after we understand what the layout for the service accounts looks like, we understand sort of the, the approach, we'll look at each of those accounts and basically we just want to check proper permissions. And these are all documented on TACnet. We want to make sure that the accounts have the right permissions inside of the service manager application itself. Basically that they're the member of the right user roles. We want to make sure they've got the right server permissions, that they're local administrators where they need to be. We want to make sure they've got the right um, SQL permissions uh, in the database for, for any of the service accounts that will be accessing the service manager database or the data warehouse databases. And we need to check permissions in any connected applications, both in the applications themselves and in their databases. So for instance, the operations manager connector run as account needs to have permissions to read objects in operations manager. The configuration manager account needs to be a DB data reader on the configuration manager database. So we'll look at any system that's plugged into service manager and make sure that the run as accounts have appropriate permissions. Um, again, what those appropriate permissions are are all documented on TechNet. Uh, so it's fairly straightforward. And the last thing that we'll do is we'll check that all the service accounts have had their SPNs registered. Um, that doesn't always happen during installation. Um, so we like to check after the fact. You can tell uh, if the service account SPNs haven't been registered because you'll see events in the Operations Manager event log for that. All right, so the, the, the data warehouse, uh, I, I think, is, is probably best described as being a bit delicate in Service Manager. And it's also, it's not intended to be manually manipulated. It's kind of a black box. Um, installing it correctly is very important. If the initial installation doesn't go well, then uh, remediating issues can be challenging. I think it's it's fair to say. Um, so, what do you typically look at when you check the the, the health of a data warehouse installation? Yeah. So, um, the one thing that that isn't listed on the slide, but that we've we've already covered, the very first place that that I'll go to look to identify the health of the data warehouse is the event log again. It's the same operations manager event log in the same location. That tends to be the best indicator. Um, specific to the data warehouse itself, we'll also check the status of the data warehouse jobs that run. Um, you can see this in the console. If you go to the data warehouse workspace, we can look at the jobs there and see their current statuses. But it's also very helpful to use PowerShell because we can get a history of statuses. I can go back and say, look at the last 10 times the job ran and make sure that the last 10 have run on their schedules that they're taking a consistent amount of time to run and that there aren't any errors. And you'll get events in the event log when, uh, on the data warehouse management server, correct? When jobs fail, yes, you will, yeah. Um, we'll also look at the uh, OLAP cube processing jobs. We sort of separate the ETL jobs, which manage moving data from the service manager database to the data warehouse databases. We separate those out from the cube processing jobs, which move data from the data warehouse data mark into the OLAP cubes. Um, those run once a day, uh, and we'll monitor those separately. They, they run on a different schedule. They have different kinds of operations. Um, and we'll make sure that those are healthy, that the cubes are processing uh, regularly, and that they have done so for, for a number of days. We'll also pay particular attention to the resources on the SSAS server, the SQL Server Analysis Server, because uh, when the OLAP cubes process, they there's a spike in the uh, memory utilization. So, you know, normal operating memory is going to be lower than when these cubes run, and we want to make sure that there's enough memory to handle that spike. Obviously, with VMs and dynamic memory, um, things are easier to, to manage there, but we want to make sure that there's enough. We'll also look at the SSRS health. Um, make sure that we can connect both in the console and in the browser to the SSRS environment. Um, and we'll run some of the out-of-the-box reports to make sure that the reports are running properly and that the uh, 
the, the parameter blocks at the top of the reports are, are set properly and that the data coming through looks appropriate. All right, so we've got three services that we're going to talk about here, um, which are the data access service, the management service, and the management configuration service. So and I, I think it's arguable that the data access service is kind of the, the big service. So why don't you talk about that? Sure. Yeah, the data access service, uh, they're all important. It, it's probably the most important service. It's a Windows Communication Foundation-based web service. And it's responsible for managing authentication and data access between any client connecting the service manager and any uh, and the management server that the data access service runs on. And clients include the console, but also PowerShell scripts, the data warehouse ETL jobs, really anything that connects to the management server in order to get to data inside of the database has to run through the data access service. If that service is down, nobody will be able to access um, service manager in any way. So the next service then is the management service. Um, this provides a, an execution workflow uh, environment for, for workflows and modules. What this really is going to do is it's what allows all of the workflow inside of service manager to run and that includes email notifications, that includes setting uh, the service level targets on incidents. There's quite a lot of different workflows that run in service manager. And the management service creates instances of um, processes on the management server that actually executes these workflows for us. The symptom you'll see if the management service isn't running is that workflows will not run. Uh, you'll also get lots of uh, errors in the event log uh, every few minutes telling you that the service has stopped and that it can't execute workflows. Um, so that one's almost as important as the data access service. If the management service isn't running, though, you'll still be able to access the console. It won't necessarily interrupt functions uh, inside of the console, but, but no, no workflow will run. In fact, I think we've seen cases where you can access the application, you can open records, close records, but you notice eventually that no workflow is running. Yeah, emails aren't getting sent, um, statuses aren't changing automatically, things like that. And the last service we have here is the Management Configuration Service. And this one sort of interacts with the other two. What it's primarily responsible for is managing the configuration, the running active configuration of the environment. So when any changes to workflow are made, um, you're creating new email notifications, you're adjusting the way workflow works in the configuration, the Management Configuration Service is responsible for letting the management service know it's got a new configuration to run off of. So, again, if we see that the management configuration service is not running, workflow will generally continue to run, no problem, but any changes to that workflow will not get picked up. So things like if you make a change um, to the criteria in an email notification, you're not going to see that change realized until the management configuration service has had a chance to run. Um, some workflows rely on the management configuration service to run, like some of the connectors. So you'll see some workflows cease to run properly if this service stops. But generally, workflow will continue to run. The best thing to do is to set up a monitor, have it monitor these services and make sure they get started. And the primary place where we see this being an issue is um, in clients doing regular server restarts. Sometimes it can take a couple of hours for these services to start back up, especially in VMs that maybe have dynamic memory and don't have enough memory at, at startup to, uh, to get everything started. Um, once these have been started, we don't typically see issues where they sort of stop themselves. And, and restarting them is often a good troubleshooting approach. It is, yeah. Often, if, if we've got a specific issue that we're dealing with, one of the first things we like to do is restart the services to see if that addresses the issue. All right, so workflow and connectors, and, and we've got a couple of different kinds or a few different kinds of workflow here to talk about. Um, so why don't you step through each one of these and tell us what they what they tell us about the health of the system. Sure. Yeah, this is a little bit technical. Um, there's four different kinds of workflow that run in Service Manager. The first is called a workflow subscription, and this is just general workflow you see in Service Manager, like uh, service level objectives uh, getting set, um, change requests, statuses, changing um, you know, the activity statuses in, impacting the activities around it, the, the built-in workflows that you see running in Service Manager. If you go into the Service Manager console under Administration, there's a workflow workspace, uh, workflow view there where you can 
create your own workflows, and you can monitor the status of existing workflows. And those all fall under this bucket. Um, so generally what we're looking for here is that the workflows are running through properly um, and that the permissions on the workflow account are sufficient to run the kinds of workflows that need to run. The next kind is notification subscriptions. Um, these are for any email notifications. So any workflow where the uh, action at the end is to send an email would fall under this bucket. Um, we treat these a little bit differently because they're interacting with an SMTP server, so we have to make sure that the health of the service manager is okay and that the SMTP server is, is getting the message and able to send the, the emails reliably. The third kind of workflow that we'll look at are called discovery workflows. And these are things like groups and queues that can be configured inside of Service Manager. So if you're not familiar, a group is a group of configuration items in Service Manager, and a queue is a group of work items. We can use these in a couple of different ways. Um, in our experience, they get used primarily to configure service level objectives. It can also be used to control access and things like that. And we'll make sure that these are running uh, properly, that changes to the groups and queues are getting picked up, um, which would rely on the management configuration service and, and that they're, they're functioning properly. The last time, uh, the last uh, type of workflow that we'll look at here are called, uh, we, we consider custom workflows. These are things that customers have built themselves. So maybe they built, um, you know, a common one that we see are PowerShell scripts that will automatically close incidents and service requests after they've been resolved for a period of time. Any custom workflow that's been developed, we like to look at it. We like to understand the requirement that it's meeting, and we like to make sure that it's built in a really, you know, in a performant way, um, and that it's meeting the functional requirement. Um, that it's that it's actually giving the customer what they want. So we'll take particular we'll pay particular close attention to those when we're coming in after this custom workflow has been put in place. And the last thing here, uh, the connectors. We'll look at any of the connectors that are configured. We'll make sure that they're configured in an efficient uh, way, and we'll make sure that they're running. So data changes in the source and the target systems appear in Service Manager. All right, so the, the portal, I mean, I, the, the portal is, in terms of health, um, if it's not healthy, it's probably going to be evident right away. Uh, this, is a, this is more or less a, it, it's going to work for you or it's not going to work for you. Um, so talk about checking the connectivity and then talk about what we would look at in the, the specific web parts. And these are, for those who aren't familiar, these are the six web parts that get installed with the SharePoint-based self-service portal and service manager. Yeah, so again, we, we'll split this up into a couple of different categories here. Um, we'll look at SharePoint first, make sure that the SharePoint site is healthy, that the SharePoint logs generally will work with the uh, customer's SharePoint administrator, um, make sure that the logs are healthy and, and that the SharePoint environment itself is configured properly, uh, and then from a networking point of view that all of the um, ports are open on the network and, and things like that. Um, once we're fairly certain that SharePoint is healthy, then we'll look at the service manager part of it, which is those web parts that get deployed when you install the self-service portal. Um, here, we want to check a couple of different things. We want to make sure that the functionality of each web part is, is working correctly. We'll walk through the service catalog, service offering, and request offering web parts and create some incidents and service requests from the portal to make sure that that's functioning properly. And we'll look at the My Requests, My Activities, and Help articles and make sure that all of the you know, all of the buttons on each of those web parts work. And we're also looking for general performance um, and, the, and the connection is set properly. The other thing we'll check here, which is not so much a technical issue as much as just making sure it's configured properly, is that permissions are set appropriately for users who are accessing the portal, that they've got the, you know, appropriate level of SharePoint uh, and the appropriate level of service manager access. Uh, in order to access the portal and see the things that they need to see. Yeah, it's probably worth noting that uh, users in the end user user role in Service Manager do not have portal access by default. That's right, yeah, one of the out-of-the-box user roles in Service Manager called end user it really exists as a template so you can create your own custom user roles in order to provide portal access. Adding them to that template itself, while you can add end users to that, it isn't going to have any impact on their portal access. So this is the last item, application configuration, and what we're talking about here are the things that you will configure within the application 
Um, and we've got them listed down the left-hand side, views, custom user roles, workflows. So I think what we're talking about here are the things that you'll go and do after install. Um, the good news about these is that you can generally go back and fix these things if there's something wrong with them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we sort of shift now from ensuring that the application was deployed properly and that the infrastructure sized appropriately. We're sort of shifting our focus now on the configuration of the application. And what we're looking at here is, is less um, that something's broken and more that something has just been configured in the most efficient way that's going to give the best uh, experience to the users of the system and be performant. Um, now there's more pieces of the application than what we've got listed here, but I think these are the probably the, the most important places to look when we talk about doing health checks because these are the sort of either user interface areas or the back-end workflow areas that are going to have the biggest impact on performance and on the reliability of the system. So the first one here is views. The reason we look at views, um, some of you might be aware that views are can be based, uh, a view, well, first of all, a view and service manager lets you see a list of objects. So for instance, I can see a list of all of the incidents that are assigned to me. I can see a list of all completed service requests. There's quite a few different views that are configured out of the box. Um, and we'll often create dozens of custom views for a customer or go into a customer environment that already has lots of custom views created. From a health check perspective, really what we want to look at is to make sure that the views are configured properly, that the criteria on them make sense. Um, there are certain tips and tricks in terms of managing you know, an AND or an OR operator to make sure that it's done efficiently. And we also want to look at the type projection that the views are based on. And we want to make sure that that's as narrowly scoped as possible. Um, a type projection is sort of like a, a database view where it can pull together related classes. So instead of just having a view showing incidents, I can have a view showing incidents and the affected user and the assigned to user and the service level objectives. A bunch of different classes that are related together. Um, the problem with using type projections that are very big is that the system's going to pull lots and lots of data whether or not it's going to show those in a column. So even if I've only got five columns in my view, if I've got a large type projection, I'm loading tons of data into memory before that view can load. So we like to look at that and make sure that they're scoped as narrowly as possible. And I think some of this comes down to the, to the way that you've designed the, the set of views that you might have, right? Yeah. So that, that you're, you're not, you don't need um, one, or don't have one big view that's showing you everything, but you can maybe break that up into a set of views that work together as a set. Absolutely, yeah, and that's an important perspective to take, I think, to sort of step back. We often find when we come into, especially environments that have been around for maybe, you know, a number of months or over a year, that things get added on over time, and it's a good time to sort of step back and make sure that the entire design still has, uh, still works together and still has a sort of a cohesive design. Um, and that's very, very true with, with views. Um, with user roles, again, here we're not really looking at um, performance issues necessarily. We just want to make sure that access for analysts and for end users is appropriate for the security context, that people get access to the things they need to get access to, um, that they aren't seeing the things that they shouldn't be seeing, and that there, there isn't um, an undue amount of security placed on the system. Sometimes there's a tendency to want to lock things down, um, so we want to make sure that folks are able to easily get access to the things they need to. Um, the other function of user roles, and probably the more common function of them, is to tailor the UI for uh, ease of use and for visibility. Um, you know, if I log into the console and I can see, you know, 50 different incident views and only three of them apply to me and help me do my job, taking access to those 47 views away doesn't necessarily hurt my ability to do my job, and it's also going to make my experience much better because I'm only seeing the things that are really relevant to me. So there's both a security context here and an experience or ease of use context, and we try to make sure that both of those are getting treated equally. Well, we do the same thing with tasks as well, because yeah, just, just right. like views, we can choose to expose or not expose certain tasks within a user role. And, and that can, that can uh, be helpful in a couple of different ways. If there are tasks that aren't relevant to a given user role, we can take them out. 
or sometimes we'll do things like we'll take tasks out to prevent certain user roles from being able to say close an incident because we don't want them to close or maybe you don't even want them to resolve an incident. So in a sense there's a there's a uh, there's security applied there or at least a restriction applied there and it also keeps this an extent keeps the UI clean. So on the fourth item there then this relates back to the workflow slide we have we'll uh, we'll look closely at any customizations that have been developed when we get into an environment. Um, there's a couple different kinds of customizations. There's class extensions or database schema extensions. There's form customizations, and again, custom workflow. So we'll look at each of those three different kinds, and we want to we want to look closely at them. We want to make sure that they're uh, again meeting the functional requirement. Um, oftentimes, you know, we find that there can be a disconnect sometimes between the way something's been configured in the system and the initial requirement it was supposed to satisfy. So we make sure that those things are still mapping, that there's still traceability between those requirements and the configurations. And we also want to make sure that they're built efficiently. Um, this is especially true with custom workflow, but it, it also applies with database extensions and form customizations. We want to make sure that they're built in the most efficient manner possible, that they're not going to negatively impact um, performance in the system, and that they're not going to prevent either upgrade conflicts or um, prevent you from moving in a certain direction in the future, that, that you don't uh, limit your flexibility to, to make changes to that configuration in the future. Sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes folks can paint themselves into a corner um, if customizations are implemented and they're um, designed uh, without taking a, a long-term perspective. Uh, although many times we can reconcile that and we can make the changes that we need to make with some manual intervention and, and get the data preserved and things like that. Um, and we had talked about workflows already. We just want to make sure that they're, again, meeting those functional requirements and that they're economically constructed, especially when there's custom code involved with like custom PowerShell scripts. We like to look at those and make sure that they're, they're written efficiently and they're not pulling uh, more data than they need to and things like that. And the last thing um, that we'll talk about here on the configuration side is management packs. We, as a matter of course, when we do implementations, we'll create a, a set of custom management packs that we'll store configurations in. And it's, it's fairly consistent um, from one customer to another when we do our implementations. Um, we like to have that set of management packs. And there's a strategy behind that that we've identified that, that is going to help both with the organization of the content um, as well as uh, it's going to assist in making the migration from a dev to a production environment easier. So when we're coming into an environment that already exists, we like to take a really good look at that management pack strategy to see if there, if there is one at all. And there, there wouldn't necessarily be one because management packs and the way you organize them is not necessarily an intuitive thing if you've just installed Service Manager and started using it. It's something that we've learned uh, over over a period of a number of years doing this work, um, that there's good ways to organize management packs and bad ways that, and, and what kind of impact that can have. Um, so we do like to take a really close look at that and see what kind of strategy a, an environment might have used for their management packs. And we'll like to generally identify improvements that they can make to that strategy. Management packs are one of those places where it can be difficult to rectify if you've gone down a certain path for a long time. It's, it's not impossible. Um, but it can be very difficult sometimes to reorganize the content inside of management packs, uh, especially if you've already deployed into production and are concerned about um, downtime and things like that. So sometimes it's limited in what we can do uh, with the reorganization of those, but it's, it's an important thing if you're thinking about implementing Service Manager and haven't done it yet, it's an important thing to understand before you do so, um, and it's definitely one of the things we take a close look at. Uh, when we come in to do our, our health checks. So we're, we're a bit over time, and, and apologies uh, to anybody who, uh, who can't stay. We're almost done. We're going to take some questions. Um, this is our, our last slide here. We just wanted to point out that Microsoft does have some published documentation on hardware and software performance for service managers, so we would encourage you to uh, visit these links and check out this information. Um, it'll go in, as you can imagine, it'll go into a bit more detail in some of these areas than we were able to go to in, in this session. 
Um, and it's also a good thing to keep an eye on because I'm sure they're going to keep this up to date, particularly as, uh, as new features are added to the application. And we're going to post this. Uh, we've been recording the session. And we're going to post this to YouTube when we're finished. And we'll put all of these links in the link dump in YouTube so you'll be able to access them there as well. And I'm sure that link will get sent around after the session's over. So with that, if uh, you'd like, you can either unmute or you can just uh, type in the IM window uh, a question. And we, we had a question earlier. Uh, Lassa asked about at what point you would start setting up a dedicated workflow server. Um, he's working with a customer now, and he can see about 80 subscription workflows in production. Yeah, um, 80 subscriptions is, is certainly above average. Um, and we That's not a bad idea. Uh, if a customer has the resources, I'm going to step back to the components um, really briefly. Um, for the benefit of folks who aren't familiar. When you've got more than one service manager management server, what you'll have is one primary and then one or more secondary management servers. And the primary management server is going to run all of your workflow. The secondary management servers will handle just console connections. And we, we like that idea a lot, actually, Lhasa. Um, reserving the primary management server for workflow and then having secondary management servers that folks can connect to for console connections, especially if you're going to have a lot of workflow or service level objectives, maybe custom workflow running. Um, we think that's a good idea, and we've, we've encouraged that in some, in some cases as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth noting, too, that there can be a lot of workflow associated with SLOs, right, because you, you've yeah. got queues that have to, uh, to calculate. And just, you know, depending upon how you construct your your SLOs, you might have, if you've got, you know, four levels of priority on your incident and you've got two SLOs, you've got, let's say, a respond SLO and a resolve SLO, well, that's eight right there. And then if you've got a, another match set for your service request, you've got 16 SLOs and then you've got the queues. And so that there can be a lot going on behind the scenes just with what seems like a basic set of SLOs. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The good news is it's pretty easy to set up a performance monitor. Um, the processes that run under workflows are, are well documented. Um, so it's pretty easy to tell how many, how much resources those specific um, processes are using on one of the servers, on the management, primary management server. So you can get a good idea of, of what it, what it's requiring. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely like that idea a lot. Okay. Well, if there are no questions, then we'll wrap it up. We appreciate everybody attending today. As Nick said, we'll get this posted to YouTube probably within the next 24 hours or so. And uh, we'll have the links there as well so that you can check out the documentation that we were. Thanks, guys. Great. Thanks.